Hey, let me start by saying thanks, Daniel, for uh, the great presentation and for the Q&A as well. I mean, you showed tremendous patience <laughs> when you were out there. Um, thank, and I learned a ton too, thank, thanks for that. Um, so I go by just Ravi, uh, just like Meenakshi Sundram, I have an extremely long name and this is my curtailed version. And it's good to be in front of an audience, no matter how big or small. I think uh, that's been about two and a half years since I did any public presentation. So always great to uh, see people. Um, so the topic of today's presentation is um, migrating from Salesforce to Dynamics. It has something to do with app modernization as well. So as many of you know that Salesforce um, is uh, possibly the CRM leader, they at least out and themselves to be. Um, this is not a presentation where I'm trying to uh, perhaps say which one of these platforms is better, uh, but there's something unique about uh, what we bring to the uh, table uh, in terms of um, a more cohesive business cloud. Uh, and we have a lot of customers who are kind of taking down the path of, hey, let's switch from SAP to Dynamics or from Oracle to Dynamics. And it's a, it's a huge opportunity for, for a lot of our customers, for a lot of our partners uh, and so forth. Um, I work as a, uh, as a principal program manager for uh, an organization within Microsoft called uh, the Industry Cloud Solutions. So what my organization does for a living is that it uh, uses the entirety of Microsoft Cloud, be it Azure, uh, Microsoft 365 or Dynamics, and builds these industry vertical solutions for finance, for healthcare, for manufacturing, sustainability um, and retail and so forth. So um, it's a huge opportunity for all of us. Um, you know, I've seen Google doing some really good stuff, um, especially when I saw their, uh, the healthcare APIs um, around which we also have an ads of healthcare APIs. Amazon has done a lot of work, so has Salesforce. So, so tremendous opportunity for our customers and partners. Um, the agenda, I'm trying to kind of switch to my slide here. It's not going through. There you go. So really very simple agenda. This is uh, something that can go on for hours, but uh, really I wanted to give you a sense for what the Microsoft Dynamics platform is about. And why do customers migrate from Dynamics, um, migrate to Dynamics from Salesforce? It's true for SAP, it's true for Oracle, uh, and some of the factors that influence this migration. And some real world examples, I, I have been involved in many different migrations from Salesforce to Dynamics, so I kind of um, can claim myself as some sort of a SME in this area, and it's not something that I was chasing intently, it just happened to my career. I uh, have a huge amount of uh, consulting experience, a lot of pre-sales experience, although that is not something that I do for a living now. Um, I kind of switched to engineering recently. Uh, so this is the Microsoft Cloud. Uh, not long ago, even within Microsoft, we used to identify ourselves as you know business applications guy or a productivity guy or, you know, the Azure Infra or an Azure App Dev person, right? So what we have done over the past three or four years is that we've built uh, more cohesiveness in our whole platform story. And we don't really talk about um, those different silos anymore. Although in reality, you know, you do, you do need some kind of a division in terms of how you go sell your products and how you build them. But really, this is really the value proposition of Microsoft Cloud. Um, the genesis, the foundation of any products that we build comes from Microsoft Azure, which is the planet scale, um, you know, your byte storage, um, you know, huge scale infrastructure and storage uh, service that we offer. It competes with um, Google Cloud, it competes with Amazon and so forth. But the thing is that within Microsoft, all of our products are literally built on top of Azure. In fact, Microsoft Dynamics 365, which is a set of business applications and the Microsoft Power Platform, which is an automation platform. We are the biggest customers for the SQL services within Azure. Um, and, um, and yeah, so the whole story is getting better and better. Uh, the synergies between our productivity platform and our Dynamics 365 CRM and ERP platforms they are getting very closer. You'd have seen many times how Teams is becoming some sort of a commonality between everything that we do in the SaaS world. Um, 
increasingly we have uh, all of these different uh, dynamics applications, which I'm going to be showing to you in a bit, uh, only on slides. Um, they've increasingly started taking advantage of Teams being a huge communications channel. Uh, we acquired LinkedIn, so the whole social and relationship graph, um, the advantage of getting having that data is also driven into each of these products. And of course, you know, we're kind of talking about Microsoft Dynamics 365 here. The what the key takeaway for you is that um, customers like this cohesiveness story. Uh, the enterprise customers love it because when they look at Salesforce and kind of um, the fact that they are going heavy on, let's say, Azure Synapse for the data platform, or, or they're going heavy on Teams, um, the integration and the siloed nature of uh, those integrations automatically brings them to the Microsoft Cloud. And we, um, I kind of told you how I work for the industry cloud solutions. We are the biggest consumers of industry cloud. So using this whole paradigm of this cohesiveness, we have started building a lot of our vertical line of business SaaS-based solutions for manufacturing, retail, healthcare, uh, finance, so to speak, right? So the Microsoft Cloud is the in thing uh, from an engineering standpoint. We are working hard to achieve a level of cohesiveness that becomes seamless for customers as they move from uh, Microsoft 365 to Dynamics, you know, using Azure services and so forth, okay? So, um, you know, given this, uh, this cohesiveness, you know, from a uh, business cloud standpoint, so we're kind of talking about the business applications, be it uh, the customer relationship management and ERP, within the Microsoft Business Cloud, which is the Dynamics 365 platform, we don't have such kind of silos per se. What we have done is that we have taken a data first approach and have built specific apps um, that are, you know, kind of range from customer engagement to your operational side. We have built specific apps that actually are extremely tightly integrated. So this is, extremely important because when you kind of look at sales and you look at human resources uh, on the surface, they may have nothing in common, but then your sellers are your you know, employees as well. Um, customer service might be a different division um, com compared to let's say your sales, but then to achieve customer 360, you, know, you need that affinity of data. Uh, and uh, what this platform does is that it brings all of these different functional areas together uh, under one platform. Is it extremely seamless? I'd be lying if I say that because a lot of the products on the ERP side came from acquisitions. Uh, you know, you're kind of talking about acquisitions that we did 15 or 16 years ago. Um, but all of those re-engineering efforts have been going on for some time and uh, kind of extremely thrilled as to how we have some customers running Microsoft Dynamics 365 for the entirety of their business operations. It used to be extremely uncommon even five or six years ago, but I've seen customers doing so um, pretty frequently now. And uh, what it does is that it brings all of these portfolio of applications, be it sales, marketing, be it finance or supply chain management under one umbrella. Again, you know, the theme here is again, cohesiveness. Um, we constantly strive as a company to build that cohesiveness amongst all of our different products. And the fact that kind of going back to the Microsoft Cloud paradigm, where we're kind of building everything on top of Azure, the same kind of cohesiveness also comes here. And underneath here is the Microsoft Power Platform, and it has a lot to do with um, the low-code, no-code app modernization efforts that our friend uh, Daniel also spoke about. Um, and I had a question for him back then that, hey, do you... Your customers use AppSheet, for example, uh, a lot. I, I, I'm assuming yes. And you know, the this business of Power Platform has grown, you know, triple, perhaps 30, 40 times over the past uh, th uh, three years. Don't quote me on that, though. Uh, but this is becoming the fundamental uh, paradigm for a lot of our customers and partners as they're kind of automating and modernizing their applications. And the good thing is that uh, there is an extreme parity between Microsoft Power Platform and all of the Dynamics 365 applications, okay? So, so this is the value prop for the key takeaway here is that, you know, all of our business application, um, business applications for customers, they operate under a single platform. It's not like uh, the customer has to buy all of this. Uh, it's just that if you're running your sales and customer service on Dynamics, 
there's a good reason for you to perhaps automate further using Power Platform and also pick field service for your field service um, operations. Okay, so this is this is a huge pull. The reason I even am presenting all these slides is because this is a big motivation for customers as they move from their legacy Salesforce or SAP over to uh, the Microsoft uh, Dynamics platform. Okay. Any questions before I proceed further? Cool. Um, so there are a number of reasons beyond the value proposition that I just uh, spoke about. There are many different reasons customers migrate to uh, Dynamics 365. That is again, this need for synergies between productivity and business applications. You know, this, you know, Salesforce bought Slack, for example, uh, to rein in that business productivity and business process integration together. Um, but again, a lot of the customers um, use Microsoft 365, SharePoint, Teams, and OneDrive, and all of those assets. And when it comes to synergies between productivity and business applications, you know, nobody does it better than Microsoft. So that becomes a reason. And then uh, Power Platform. Uh, kind of undergoes some sort of a chain reaction because uh, it is a no clips coding platform. Uh, it's a low code, no code platform. Anybody here in this room can go ahead and build a power app uh, pretty quickly. And as, and you know, there's this concept of dataverse, which I'm not going to get into, you know, it's a relational database uh, that can be used as a transactional uh, storehouse. Um, when Power Platform takes shape, it actually proliferates uh, rather quickly. And when that happens, it automatically pulls in the lever for dynamics as well. So that's, that becomes one of the reasons. And again, you know, you see customers who are grappling with these highly customized legacy applications. They're looking to modernize and they're looking for a destination and they're looking at perhaps Salesforce and SAP and saying, do we want to do everything that we did here? You know, we already have a bunch of .NET developers. We have Power Platform builders. Let's take that route. Maybe why not investigate dynamics? Um, changes in business climate. You know, be it mergers or acquisitions or um, you know something has happened in terms of partnership with Microsoft for the fact that we um, have a huge enterprise play. We are kind of almost everywhere that you can imagine. That can also uh, you know, mandate a fresh start. And again, the beauty of the fact that everything that we do is built on Azure is that the affinity between all of our Dynamics applications and something like uh, Azure Synapse, which is a modern cloud um, data warehousing platform, serverless um, as well, that affinity, that integration is much, much more smoother. Um, you know, so the smoother data pipelines, that becomes one of the reason. And uh, almost everything that Microsoft does is that when we talk about these huge platforms, we also have an on-premise component, right? I mean, um, we have, we deal with so many regulated industries. We have a huge uh, set of customers in the federal and the PubSec in the finance uh, space. So, you know, some people want to move from Salesforce on the cloud, something has happened, new compliance to, um, to adhere to, and they move to our on-premises, uh, um, you know, hosting uh, version. And then finally, you know, tough renewal. I think Salesforce is famous for their tough renewals and uh, <clears throat> a few, few occasions, uh, you know, tempers rise, uh, you know, and the flare and, you know, let's switch platforms becomes the mantra, right? So these are some of the reasons why um, customers migrate to Dynamics. Okay, any questions? Has anyone here, anyone here that uses Salesforce or Dynamics by any chance for a platform? No. Um, good, good. So when you migrate to Microsoft Cloud, which is to Dynamics, there are some guiding principles that you go through in the sense that, um, these are the, you don't really have to worry about the rightmost column, but uh, the guiding principles become uh, fairly important. Um, we always guide our customers to go beyond lift and shift. There is no point in moving from a heavily customized uh, Salesforce legacy customer service application and take that whole, whole lot of technical depth and complexity and push it to dynamics. You're just, creating new problems in a new place. Um, so it's a lot about kind of going beyond lift and shift, focusing on the reduction of technical depth. And, um, you know, the advent of Power Platform and the affinity of Power Platform with Dynamics means that a lot could be done by just configuring uh, and not by customizing or writing code. 
So configure first becomes a very good uh, guiding principle. But again, I think I was talking with that gentleman, Mark, I suppose, as to how uh, sometimes, you know, we have to flex the business to meet um, the uh, technical capabilities and vice versa. So there's always the dance that happens when it when you kind of trying to embed a business process in a particular business cloud. And um, we always feel like have, taking a low code approach is, is a good approach because when you, it has cascading effects down the line. The more code you bake in, the more you have to maintain and manage, the more you have to constantly update, your CI, CD becomes difficult and so forth. And again, focusing on business out, outcomes, no brainer there. Um, there are other guiding principles such as uh, you know, automation of manual processes. When you're kind of doing this, moving from one cloud to the other, you may, I might as well do some uh, more finesse, add some more finesse to your business processes. Why not you know, do a lot of these automation? Um, you know, focus on UX, uh, leverage the entirety of Microsoft Cloud Stack. If you're purchasing Dynamics 365 sales, chances are that you already have Microsoft Teams, maybe you're already using Azure. Let's make the most out of this. Let, when we design this, let's make the most out of it. And um, again, you know, you can do data migration in many different ways, but then there are many different tool sets in the ecosystem that we generally recommend uh, that could be used. Um, Again, when it comes to all of these business applications, reporting is key, data insights are key, and uh, the way you actually structure your data, the way you actually design your data, uh, it becomes key in as to how well you leverage the reporting. So you don't need to have the same kind of data model that you had in your previous legacy application, be it Salesforce, you can actually now have the advantage of designing for a data model that benefits you and your end users. Uh, and finally, when you know when something of this kind of a switch happens, you're always going to have folks who are going to uh, be heartbroken because they loved their Salesforce or SAP or Oracle. Uh, and there's a certain amount of change management that needs to take place, that certain amount of training, certain amount of governance in order to assure the users that this has its own benefits and you've got to tout the benefits and sell this internally. And, uh, you know, be it deployment, change management, or training, something that you need to consider, okay? Um, so, you know, and if you look at the right side column, you know, it kind of talks about all of the various capabilities that we bring to the table, a uh, lot of which is already used by many different customers, even if they're not using Dynamics per se, okay? So any, any questions uh, before I move ahead? Good, good. So uh, there are, when we talk about the kind of the migration from Salesforce um, to Dynamics, there's really a spectrum of different complexity and factors, right? So on the low complex complexity side, you can kind of literally get this done in two to three uh, months, you know, where your legacy application it possibly has no customizations at all. Someone just tweaked, uh, for example, the Salesforce sales cloud. Uh, it has no integrations, it kind of has siloed and um, the reports are all standard out of the box, the number of accounts, my opportunities, my tasks and so forth. And then the data migration is pretty simple, right? And uh, there is no app exchange. An app exchange is Salesforce's uh, app ecosystem. Uh, you know, as a business user, you can just take your credit card, buy a new app, deploy it and you'll be good to go, right? So that's on the low complexity side. You also have medium complexity that takes about six months, which is that, you know, there are some customizations, there are some standalone force.com apps, there are some integrations, the reports are simple, but, you know, not as simple as, you know, you're kind of pulling something out of the box. Um, the data migration is tad bit complex and you, there are also one or two app exchange apps, uh, which means that you need to go find a new home. It could be, for example, a contract contract management app or a CPQ app, for example. Um, and finally, there is the high complexity. These are uh, customers and end users that have used this forever. It has a global footprint. Uh, this can take anywhere from you know, 18 to 24 months. I've written six here, uh, but it generally takes more than that. Um, there are many customizations. There are many standalone apps. You have a team with four star with uh, that has built force.com capabilities. Salesforce has been used as kind of the primary automation platform. 
Um, there are multiple integrations, your integrations to data warehouse, there are substream integrations, um, you know, downstream integrations, there are integrations to other reporting tools and so forth. And then, you know, because the data model could be extremely complex, a data migration can actually come from many different sources. And they have a multitude of apps exchange products, you know, be it CPQ, uh, some sort of productivity products and so forth. And all of those need, need a new, new home. So uh, that becomes kind of the continuum. And um, I have four examples um, of, of which, you know, I, I cannot reveal the name of these customers, of course, because um, it's kind of sacrosanct or, you know, I might run into some legal issues, but this was a global uh, PC and print printer manufacturer on the extreme right side. You look at the migration complexity, the customer, these are all the factors that we just spoke about in the previous slide. Um, so be it uh, the large customizations, large integrations, large reports and large data migration, uh, you know, it took a good, um, you know, 24 months for us to actually migrate them, migrate 30,000 global users uh, and 200,000 partners in their channel, in their partner channel across their sales and customer service. So this was a huge opportunity, but also took a lot of time. Um, and again, you know, this was a um, company that was undergoing a huge amount of transformation. They had just split into two different entities. Um, they were kind of moving from a licensing model to a subscription model. And, uh, you know, you look at the solution, the number of places that we had to actually re-innovate for them, um, it, um, it took some time. And uh, they're still running on dynamics. Uh, the experience has been great. And... Uh, one such example here. The second is that of a bank. Uh, again, in the wealth management space, you, uh, you know, this is the other extreme of that example where all of these different factors were on the other end, right? Small amount of customization, small integration, small reports, and not a whole lot of data. But then in this case, you know, the customer had this challenge where they were running Salesforce, Pega, they were kind of running some um, .NET applications, and they were all siloed. So we had to kind of literally reinvent um, all of their business processes in a much more cohesive, automated way on Dynamics. And, um, you know, 16,000 users, no joke, which means that deployment is always going to be hard. Change management is going to be hard and, you know, new way of doing things, so to speak. Um, so that was uh, the wealth management. And then this is uh, one of the top um, software vendors, we have a huge partnership going with them. They were also moving from kind of this one-time licensing, uh, recurring licensing to a subscription model. And they were a huge Salesforce customer. In fact, um, they were a huge uh, competitor as well in terms of the Salesforce marketing cloud. And, uh, you know, they took the decision of running anything and everything and building anything and everything on top of Azure. So they moved from many different vendors, you know, AWS included, and they did made a decision that they're going to do everything on um, Azure going forward, which meant that they also had to, uh, you know, to take advantage of, I don't know, I'm not a seller, but in terms of your enterprise agreement, uh, there are good incentives if you also move your sticky, um, you know, line of business applications, um, you know, from your legacy, in this case, Salesforce to uh, Dynamics. But if you if you look here, you know, again, you know, this is a good chart in terms of customizations. There were not a whole lot of customizations, but then huge amount of integrations, the data was complex and the reports were also complex. And again, um, specific to this particular customer, we had to do a lot of data modeling again because uh, over 10 years, the data model was totally um, underwhelming. Uh, the reporting was getting crazy and they literally made their sales and customer service CRM look like an ERP. So the sellers had to fill like these three, to create an opportunity, they had to fill like rows and rows of columns and, uh, and, and fields and uh, it was getting a bit crazy for them. Um, and lastly, again, a PC manufacturer, um, I think, again, you kind of transform one person in the one customer in the ecosystem, the other guy looks at you and says, hey, why not I also do the same? Uh, the same thing happened here. Um, again, in the, the uniqueness of this case is, was that 
Uh, this was again a global deployment of Salesforce, but they had five different uh, instances, which means that uh, times five number of app exchange products, uh, no central governance, and again, a struggle with uh, customer 360 because they have kind of all sorts of uh, um, kind of pipelines going uh, to get the report. So you can imagine that everything is complicated here. When you have, when you're running your global business operations across, uh, you know, five different Salesforce instances for customer service and sales, it is always going to be complicated. But then the challenge here was that um, it's hard to have one instance of um, dynamics because you have the countries like China or Russia or even Brazil, for example, where you have a huge amount of data compliance that you need to pay attention to. Uh, in fact, in China, you cannot run anything outside of its mainland. Um, again, you know, it was a bit of a give and take and we kind of chose Hong Kong as the uh, data center to host the solution. Um, again, they are kind of reaping the benefits of having the fewest amount of um, business operation instances and um, are doing great. All right, so that, I don't know if I went too fast for all of you, um, but then in summary, uh, the Dynamics 365 platform and ecosystem is thriving. Uh, I'm an example of a professional who built his career around Azure App Dev and Dynamics, and I think I'm doing pretty well, um, which has taken me to the industry cloud um, solutions team within Microsoft. And uh, it's becoming extremely common uh, by virtue of how we license out um, our software and for the fact that we are engineering some really good capabilities uh, into the whole, the whole of the Microsoft cloud that people are literally kind of running to our platform. We see a lot on the ERP side for sure, secondarily on um, the uh, CRM side, but holistically on the power platform side, that is uh, spreading like fire. Um, and again, you know, the migration again comes, brings together a lot of different factors. Um, we kind of looked at those factors, be it integrations, reports, data model, and so forth, customizations, and, uh, and it's a good story. It's an extremely complicated topic that I've tried to cover in less than 30 minutes. So, um, you know, apologies <clears throat> if I just ran too fast, um, but then I'm here to help. I have a very, uh, impressive um, alias at Microsoft, it's called Raving. Yeah, I was gonna comment on uh, that. Yeah, that's Raving. Cool. That's <laughs> I know, right? Obviously, with your name in there, but yeah. Raving about <laughs> Dynamics 365. I know, right? So. Raving lunatic. I used to get, make that a joke, you know? So when I used to say Raving, I used to give an example like Raving Lunatic, you know, that's how you remember, so. Well, I'll lock it in with the memory <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows where to email. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So thank you for your time. If there are any questions, happy to answer. Yes.